1981. Harry James Potter was born on the 31st of July 1980 at Godrick's Hollow in the West Country, England. Around this time, a prophecy regarding a boy born at the end of July with the power to defeat Voldemort was stated to wizards. Harry's christening was quiet and quick, with only his mother, father, and Sirius Black in attendance. Harry spent his infancy in hiding with his parents at the Potter Cottage. For Harry's first birthday, Sirius bought him a toy broomstick. Lily's letter to Sirius mentioned that this broomstick had been Harry's favorite present and that he had smashed a horrible vase that had been a gift from Petunia and nearly killed their cat. Lily and James also hosted a very quiet birthday tea. The only ones in attendance were them, Harry, and Batilda Bagshot, who also used to dote on infant Harry. The Potters owned a cat, but what happened to it after Voldemort's attack remains unknown. When it became clear that Voldemort marked the Potters for death in regards to the prophecy, Albus Dumbledore suggested that they use the Fidelius charm to keep them safe. He even offered to be the Potters' secret keeper, but the Potters had already planned to make Sirius their secret keeper instead. On Sirius's advice, they changed this designation to Peter Pettigrew, who they thought would be less suspicious. In a terrible turn of fate, Pettigrew was a Death Eater spy and betrayed the Potter's whereabouts barely a week later. Attack at Godric's Hollow, 1981 On the evening of Halloween in 1981, Lord Voldemort arrived at Godric's Hollow and murdered James and Lily. He murdered James first, who tried to distract the Dark Lord. Unfortunately, he did not have his wand with him and was immediately killed. Voldemort then advanced on Lily, who died trying to protect Harry. Her sacrifice prevented the killing curse from working on Harry, resulting in her love for her child becoming a barrier protecting him. When Voldemort attempted the curse on Harry, it backfired on the caster, and instead of murdering Harry, Voldemort lost all his powers and his physical form was obliterated. Voldemort was saved from death by the five horcruxes he had made up to that point. This later included Harry himself, because a piece of Voldemort's unstable soul latched onto the only living being present. This gave him some of Voldemort's abilities, such as the ability to speak Parseltongue. This event made Harry the only person to have survived the killing curse, thus giving him the title The Boy Who Lived. The failed curse left a lightning bolt scar on his forehead, marking him as Voldemort's equal. Rubus Hagrid rescued Harry from the house, partially destroyed by Voldemort's faulty killing curse, and was given specific orders from Albus Dumbledore to take him to his aunt and uncle. As Hagrid left, he was intercepted by Sirius Black, a close friend of the Potters, who pleaded for Hagrid to give the baby to him, as he was the chosen guardian in the event of James and Lily's death. Hagrid refused, saying that he was under orders from Dumbledore to take Harry to his relatives. Sirius reluctantly relented and gave Hagrid his flying motorcycle to take Harry to Privet Drive. Hagrid delivered Harry to Dumbledore late in the evening of November 1st, 1981. Dumbledore left a letter of explanation to the family living in the house, the Dursleys, who did not want to take care of Harry. Life at Privet Drive as the Dursleys were muggles, they could not use magic. They knew about its existence, but refused to associate with witches and wizards. They proudly considered themselves a normal family and despised anything out of the ordinary. They lied to Harry about his parents' death, claiming that they had died in a car crash. They also claimed that the lightning bolt scar on Harry's forehead was from the same crash. Petunia and Vernon Dursley, Harry's new guardians, forbade him from asking questions, particularly those regarding his parents. They resented Harry for his magic, which was sporadic but evident, and strongly discouraged any sort of imagination. They neglected Harry, verbally and emotionally abused him, and inflicted cruel punishments like depriving him of meals and locking him in the cupboard under the stairs whenever something unusual occurred. Their behavior was left unreported to the authorities. In his youth, Harry could make strange things happen without understanding why he could, as no one had told him that he was a wizard. Harry's hardship, however, was highly necessary, as by returning to live with his mother's only living blood relative, the protection that Lily gave Harry would continue. Unbeknownst to Harry, one of his neighbors, Arabella Fig, was a squib, who had been ordered by Albus Dumbledore to keep an eye on Harry, but not to reveal anything of the wizarding world to him. On the 23rd of June, 1991, Dudley's 11th birthday, the Dursleys went to the zoo with Dudley and Pierce. Unfortunately for the Dursleys, they had to take Harry with them as Miss Fig had broken her leg and there was no one to take Harry, and they refused to leave him alone in their house. At the zoo, Harry spoke with a boa constrictor and unintentionally made the glass of its enclosure disappear. This allowed the snake to slither out of its cage, which scared Dudley into thinking it was after him. Harry was able to communicate in parcel tongue with the freed boa, which thanked Harry briefly, then slithered out of the reptile house calmly. After this incident, the enraged Dursleys sentenced Harry to his cupboard until the beginning of summer holidays. Discovery of Being a Wizard On the week of Harry's birthday, hundreds of letters began arriving at the Dursleys' home, addressed to him from a place called Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. 
When Uncle Vernon first read the letter, he turned a pale porridge gray out of fear that witches and wizards were trying to contact Harry. Because of this, Vernon tried to destroy the letters in a futile attempt to keep Harry from his destiny. But the letters kept coming in increasingly larger quantities to the point where they started flying out of the fireplace by the dozens. And as they did, the Dursleys saw no alternative but to flee from them. On July 30th, 1991, in a final desperate move, the Dursleys moved to a shack on a rocky island at the edge of the sea. At midnight on Harry's birthday, Rubus Hagrid appeared in person to find out why Harry had not received his letter. He was infuriated by the Dursleys and explained to Harry, in spite of Vernon's obstinate protests, that he was a wizard. How his parents died, that Dumbledore demanded to take Harry from the ruined house to his hated relatives, this would be Harry's first birthday celebration, and Hagrid gave him a small homemade birthday cake and later a snowy owl. Hagrid took Harry to the Leaky Cauldron, where he learned that he was famous. He met Quirinius Quirrell, the soon-to-be Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher at Hogwarts, Hagrid then took Harry to Diagon Alley, where he learned more about his fame in the wizarding world and that his parents had left him a small fortune in a vault at Gringotts Wizarding Bank. Harry bought his first wand from Ollivanders that very day. The wand that chose Harry was made of Hollywood and had a phoenix feather core. It was 11 inches, nice and supple. The phoenix feather at its core came from Dumbledore's phoenix fox. It was crafted by Garrick Ollivander, who had also created a twin wand. This twin wand had chosen Tom Riddle as its master long ago. Hogwarts Years, 1991-1997 to 1997. Harry was guided further to his destiny on the 1st of September 1991 when he was dropped off by the Dursleys at King's Cross Station. With only 10 minutes left and the train's departure at 11am, Harry was panicking when he overheard a red-headed family complaining about the station being packed with muggles, and he noticed how they had an owl with their belongings. Harry watched as the older boys magically passed through the barrier between platforms 9 and 10. Harry nervously interrupted them and was introduced to their youngest son, Ron, who was starting his first year as well. Molly, Ron's mother, kindly gave him instructions on how to board the platform. Harry quickly ran through the barrier, followed by Ron, and arrived on the platform, catching his first sight of the Hogwarts Express. After boarding, the train soon departed, and Ron asked if he could sit with Harry, who agreed. Ron asked Harry about his scar, and Harry asked if Ron's whole family were wizards, which they are, except for his mother's second cousin, who was an accountant. When the trolley witch came by around half past 12, Harry bought some of the treats from the cart and shared them with Ron. Neville Longbottom soon came by searching for his lost toad Trevor. While Ron was attempting a magic spell to change his rat's scabbers, Hermione Granger interrupted trying to find Trevor. After Ron's spell failed, Hermione introduced herself and upon learning Harry's name, informed him that he was in several books on magical history. Upon arriving, Hagrid gathered all the first years together and they followed a path down to the edge of a great lake. In groups of no more than four, they climbed aboard a little fleet of boats and sailed across the lake to an underground harbor. Helping to remind Neville to take his toad, Hagrid took them up a passageway to the gates of the castle. The new students were greeted at the castle door by Professor Minerva McGonagall, who explained the four houses of Hogwarts, as well as the rules of the House Cup. McGonagall led the first years into the Great Hall where they were greeted by the rest of the students, and more importantly, a shabby wizard's hat on a small stool. Harry was particularly anxious as he did not feel that any of the houses as they were described in the hat song were right for him. Harry noted that Draco Malfoy, whom Harry had met in Diagon Alley, was instantly placed in Slytherin. When Harry put on the hat, it slipped down past his eyes, and the hat told him that he would do well in Slytherin, and remembered what Hagrid and Ron had told him about Slytherin's reputation for turning out dark wizards, and that Voldemort had been in Slytherin. Thinking of Voldemort, Harry desperately repeated the phrase, not Slytherin. The hat heeded Harry's request and placed Harry in Gryffindor along with Ron and Hermione Granger. The sorting ceremony was followed by the start of term feast. Having previously never been allowed to eat as much as he wanted, Harry was overwhelmed by the sheer variety of foods in front of him. It was during the feast that Harry's scar hurt for the first time. Harry was looking up at the staff table at Professor Quirrell when the hook-nosed teacher Quirrell was talking to looked past Quirrell at Harry, who immediately felt a sharp pain in his scar. After the last morsels melted from the golden plates and goblets, Dumbledore gave a speech welcoming the new students to the school and the old students back. He added a few warnings about staying away from the Forbidden Forest and avoiding the third floor corridor before leading the school in singing the school song and sending everyone off to their dormitories. In his first ever potions class, Harry discovered that Professor Snape hated him, mocking him as the school's new celebrity before teaching the class how to brew a boil cure potion. Harry and Ron went to Hagrid's hut for tea where they met Hagrid's large and fierce looking dog, Fang. While they were talking, Harry picked up a clipping from the Daily Prophet that was lying on the table. 
The article detailed a break-in that occurred on Harry's birthday at Gringotts. The vault that was broken into was number 713, the same vault Hagrid visited with Harry on their trip to Diagon Alley. One of the things that Harry had been looking forward to was learning to fly until he found out that the Gryffindors would be taking flying lessons with the Slytherins. Madame Rolanda Hooch taught the class by starting with basic broom control. After learning the theory, the students were told to hover gently off the ground on Madame Hooch's go-ahead. Terrified of being left behind, Neville panicked and kicked off before anyone else, rising 50 feet in the air before falling off and breaking his wrist. Madam Hooch took Neville to the hospital wing after warning the other students to stay on the ground until she got back. Draco Malfoy nicked Neville's remember-all from the ground and was told to give it to Harry, jeering that he would leave it up a tree unless Harry stopped him and took off on his broom. Harry mounted his broom and kicked off after him. As much to his surprise as everyone else is, he discovered that not only could he fly, but it was something that he did not need to be taught. Bending low on the broom handle, he shot toward Draco, who realized that Harry was a better flyer and threw the remember all into the air, daring the famous boy to catch it. Harry raced the ball towards the ground, catching it and coming out of his dive a foot from the ground. He toppled lightly on the grass amidst the cheers of the Gryffindors, grinning wildly. His euphoria did not last long, however, as Professor McGonagall quickly arrived on the scene. Having seen the dive, she ordered Harry to follow her. Expecting punishment, Harry was instead introduced to Oliver Wood, whom she pulled out of a charms class. Harry told Ron about everything that happened after he left with McGonagall over dinner that night. Much calmer on the ground, Draco came over to taunt Harry about getting in trouble earlier. Enraged that Harry not only escaped trouble but was instead rewarded, he challenged Harry to a wizard's duel. Harry accepted the challenge. As they left the tower, the trio found Neville, whose wrist had been fixed by Madame Pomfrey, waiting outside, having forgotten the password. Neville decided to go with them and the four arrived at the trophy room, the site of the duel, but Malfoy was nowhere to be found. They speculated that he may have chickened out and were deciding what to do next when they heard the school caretaker, Argus Filch, and his cat, Mrs. Norris, enter the room. Realizing that Draco tricked them and informed Filch of their location, the four kids ran right to the end of the corridor where they found themselves stopped by a locked door, which Hermione opened with the unlocking charm using Harry's wand. They hurried inside, thinking themselves out of danger until turning around and coming face to face with a monstrous sight, a giant three-headed dog. Choosing Filch over death, the children ran for it, somehow managing to get back to their dormitory without running into anyone along the way. Over breakfast the next morning, Harry and Ron were discussing what Fluffy could be guarding when the mail arrived. Harry, who had received no mail apart from Hagrid's letter, was intrigued as anyone else by the long, oddly shaped package in the mail and was even more surprised than the others when he discovered what was inside. A Nimbus 2000, and with a note from Professor McGonagall warning him not to open the package at the table, and that he was to meet Wood that night for Quidditch practice. On Halloween, Professor Flitwick began teaching his students how to perform the levitation charm. Only Hermione succeeded. Offended by her air of superiority, Ron later made a nasty comment that she overheard. The comment was about her lack of friends, causing her to run off and lock herself in the girls' bathroom in tears, and making him and Harry feel guilty. When the two went down to the Halloween feast later, their guilt was forgotten amidst the splendor of the decorations. Partway into the feast, Quirrell arrived to announce that there was a 12-foot mountain troll in the dungeons before fainting where he stood. The prefects led the students back to their dorms, but Harry realized that Hermione did not know about the troll and convinced Ron to help save her since they were responsible. They sneaked off to the girls' bathroom to warn Hermione, locking the troll inside. However, they did not realize their mistake until they heard Hermione's terrified scream emanate from the bathroom. A horrified Harry and Ron ran back into the bathroom to rescue her. After a brief skirmish, during which Harry stuck his wand up the troll's nose, Ron finally knocked the troll out, levitating the troll's own club to smash into its head. Attracted by the troll's yells, the teachers arrived to find Harry, Ron, and Hermione covered in dust and the bathroom in disarray. Professor McGonagall, head of Gryffindor, began scolding the boys for not going straight to their dormitories with the rest of their house, but instead putting themselves in grave danger. Much to Harry and Ron's surprise, Hermione lied to McGonagall and told her that she had gone looking for the troll and that she thought she could handle it and she most likely would be dead if the boys had failed to rescue her. The three bonded over the shared experience and were friends thereafter. As the Quidditch season began, Harry became increasingly nervous. The first match of the season was against Slytherin. Harry was under increasing pressure to show that he was not just a famous name. During a break on the day before the match, Harry noticed that Snape was limping as though his leg were injured, strengthening his suspicions that the potions master was after whatever it was Fluffy was guarding. Harry had little time to dwell on Snape's injury as the first Quidditch match began the next morning. Harry's job as being Gryffindor's seeker was to catch the Golden Snitch. 
The Snitch is a walnut-sized gold ball that's extremely fast and difficult to see. The entire match rested upon the retrieval of the Snitch. Harry's first attempt to catch the Snitch was foiled when the Slytherin Seeker blatched him. Though the Seeker was penalized, the move succeeded in stopping Harry from getting to the Snitch. Soon after, Harry's broom began bucking uncontrollably as if trying to unseat him. The bucking became even more violent with each passing second until Harry was hanging from the broom with just one hand. As the crowd looked on with horror, some of the professors had their wands at the ready should he fall. Hermione, who had turned her gaze away from Harry and was scanning the stands, noticed that Snape was staring unblinkingly at Harry and muttering nonstop under his breath. Thinking quickly, Hermione took advantage of the fact that everyone's attention was now focused on Harry and the Weasley twins' attempts to rescue him, and she ran around the entire stadium and ended up behind Snape. Muttering a few well-chosen words, Hermione lit Snape's robes on fire with bluebell flames. Suddenly up in the air, the spell on Harry's broomstick was broken and he was once more able to control his broom. The spectators watched in confusion as Harry dove towards the ground only to clasp his hand to his mouth as if he were being violently sick the instant he landed. In actuality, Harry had caught the snitch in his mouth. The capture of the snitch ended the match, resulting in Gryffindor's victory. After the match, Hagrid took the three back to his hut. Ron and Hermione told Harry and Hagrid about what was happening on the other side of the stands, and how Snape was cursing his broomstick. Hagrid, however, did not believe them, asking why Snape would try to kill Harry. Harry told Hagrid about Snape being bitten by the dog on the third floor corridor. Surprised by their knowledge, Hagrid involuntarily revealed that the dog belonged to him, and that what the dog was guarding did not concern them, as it was a secret known only to Albus Dumbledore and a man called Nicholas Flamel. Impressed as they were with the fact that Harry had managed to hold onto a bucking broomstick, Malfoy soon found that the rest of the school no longer found his taunts that Harry was to be replaced amusing, and so reverted to teasing Harry about having to stay at Hogwarts for the holidays. Harry, however, was looking forward to spending Christmas away from the Dursleys, especially in light of the fact that Ron was also staying at Hogwarts, but also because it would give them some time to look up Nicholas Flamel. They were certain that the librarian would be able to find a book on Flamel in an instant, but were worried that it might be suspicious, and thus were forced to look for themselves. On Christmas Day, Harry and Ron awoke to a pile of presents, each at the foot of their beds. At the bottom of the pile, he found a package containing an invisibility cloak and an anonymous note telling him that the cloak once belonged to his father, and to use it well. That night, Harry thought on the cloak and decided to try it out. Realizing he could go anywhere, he snuck back to the library and headed straight for the restricted section. Knowing he had to start somewhere, Harry pulled down one of the heavier books and let it fall open on his knee. To his shock and horror, the silence was rent by a blood-curdling scream that issued from the book in front of him. He stuffed the book back in its place and ran for the door, knocking over the lantern that he brought with him in his haste. Ducking under Filch's outstretched arms, Harry ran down the dark corridors, away from the library and away from Filch. Thinking he'd escaped, Harry was scared to hear Filch's voice approaching, and horrified when he realized whom Filch was talking to, Snape. Thinking quickly and panicking slightly, Harry noticed a door to his left. Slipping inside, he found himself in an abandoned classroom. After Filch and Snape passed his hiding place, Harry relaxed and took in more details about the room he was in. In doing so, he noticed something that he missed the first time, an old gilded mirror. Stepping in front of the mirror, Harry nearly cried out in shock. Inside the mirror, he saw a large crowd of people standing behind him. Shocked, Harry turned around to look at the room and saw no one there. Turning back to the mirror and looking more closely, Harry realized that the man and woman in the front looked oddly like him. The man looked just like him from his untidy hair to his glasses, and the woman, Harry saw, had the same eyes that he had. Harry was looking at his family, for the first time in his life. The next night, Harry brought Ron with him to the mirror room. Ron did not see Harry's family in the mirror, but instead saw himself standing alone, tall, holding the house cup, wearing badges indicating that he was head boy and Quidditch captain. The next day, Ron, worried about being caught and about his friend's obsession with the mirror, warned Harry not to return. However, Harry was not to be dissuaded. Going to the room that evening, Harry was ready to stay there all night, staring at the family he lost. However, in his haste, he failed to notice Professor Dumbledore standing by the door until after he removed his cloak. Dumbledore, who had been waiting for Harry, explained that the mirror, which was known as the Mirror of Erised, displayed the deepest, most desperate desire of whoever looked into it. Harry, who had never known his family, saw them standing around him. Before sending Harry back to bed, however, Dumbledore warned him that the mirror was a dangerous object. He told Harry that the mirror was to be moved to a new location and warned Harry not to go looking for it. Despite his promise to Dumbledore, Harry found it difficult to forget the image of his parents. 
Having realized how much Harry, Ron, and Hermione had worked out about the stone after running into them in the library, Rubus Hagrid told them to meet him in his hut later. When the trio arrived, they noticed that the fire was lit despite the heat of the day. Although he was reluctant to answer their questions, Hermione managed to manipulate him into talking about the various protections used to guard it. Fluffy, the three-headed dog, was Hagrid's, along with enchantments from Professors Sprout, Flitwick, McGonagall, Quirrell, and Snape. Growing uncomfortable in the heat, Harry asked Hagrid to open a window, something Hagrid refused to do as he had a dragon egg in the fire. Unfortunately, Draco Malfoy discovered the dragon and decided to use the knowledge to get revenge by getting them into trouble for possessing an illegal dragon. To save everyone involved, Harry, Ron, and Hermione convinced Hagrid to send Norbert off to Ron's brother, Charlie Weasley, who would take Norbert to a Romanian dragon preserve. Minerva McGonagall, who was very disappointed in them, gave the three detention, which they were to serve along with Malfoy. Argus Filch took them into the Forbidden Forest where Hagrid was waiting for them. Hagrid led them up into the Forbidden Forest and showed them a pool of unicorn blood on the ground. They split up. As they continued, Harry noticed the pools of unicorn blood they were following seemed to be growing larger and larger, as if the animal had been thrashing around. Eventually, they came to a clearing and found it laying on the ground, and very dead. As they watched, a hooded figure emerged from the bushes and began to drink the unicorn's blood. Malfoy screamed and bolted away with Fang, leaving Harry, half-blinded in the pain from his scar, to stumble away from the advancing figure. Harry was saved by Firenze, a Palomino centaur, who allowed Harry to ride on his back out of the forest. Firenze told Harry the properties of unicorn blood. Harry realized that there would only be one person so desperate as to kill a unicorn, Lord Voldemort. While talking to Ron and Hermione after finishing their exams, Harry realized the strange coincidence that had occurred. Hagrid wanted a dragon more than anything else, only to meet a stranger who had one to give him. They ran down to ask Hagrid more about the man who gave him Norbert, only to find out that the stranger never lowered his hood, something of a fashion in the hogshead. Hagrid explained that he could not remember much as the man kept buying him drinks, but he said that he thought they talked about Hogwarts and the kinds of creatures that Hagrid looks after there. Focused on remembering what happened that night, Hagrid accidentally let slip that Fluffy fell asleep when played music. Now convinced that Snape had all the information he needed to get past Fluffy, Harry, Ron, and Hermione decided to go see Professor Dumbledore and tell him their suspicions. While walking across the entrance hall, they were stopped by Professor McGonagall and decided to tell her what they had found out. She insisted that no one could steal the stone and told them that Dumbledore was in London for the day. As the trio set off that night to stop Snape, they were stopped themselves by Neville, who believed they were sneaking out without reason again, and he was worried that they would lose Gryffindor even more points. Desperate as they were for time, Hermione paralyzed Neville. When they arrived at the third floor corridor, it was to find Fluffy awake but a harp by his feet. Remembering what Hagrid told them, Harry began to blow into the wooden flute that Hagrid gave him for Christmas. From the first notes, Fluffy's eyes began to droop and he quickly fell asleep. Jumping through the trap door, they found themselves in Professor Sprout's room, filled with Devil's Snare, which almost smothered them. The next room, Professor Flitwick's, held a bunch of flying keys and some broomsticks. Harry found the correct key, caught it, and unlocked the next door. The next room was Professor McGonagall's and had a large chess board for a game of wizard's chess, which Ron won at the cost of sacrificing himself. Harry and Hermione continued to the next room, leaving an unconscious Ron where they could return for him to find an unconscious troll, Professor Quirrell's room. Lastly, they encountered Professor Snape's room and found seven potions in bottles along with a roll of paper giving clues on which one to drink to continue, a logic puzzle. Hermione solved the puzzle and, at Harry's urging, drank the potion that allowed her to head back so she could get Ron out, while Harry drank the potion to go forward to the final room. Once inside the room, Harry's attention was drawn to two things, the Mirror of Erised and Quirrell. Quirrell bound Harry before explaining that the mirror was the key to finding the stone. Desperate to distract him from the mirror, Harry questioned Quirrell who revealed that he was serving Lord Voldemort. And although Snape hated Harry, because Snape allegedly loathed his father during their time at school, he never wanted him dead. Unable to locate the stone, Quirrell asked Voldemort for help. Much to Harry's surprise, looking in the mirror, Harry saw his reflection pull the stone out of his pocket and replace it, at which point he felt the real stone drop in his real pocket. He told Quirrell that he saw himself winning the House Cup, but Voldemort, skilled at legitimacy, informed Quirrell that Harry was lying and ordered Quirrell to allow him to speak to the boy. Quirrell unwrapped his turban and turned away from Harry. Sticking out of the back of Quirrell's head, Voldemort demanded that Harry give him the stone. Harry refused, and Quirrell seized him, causing Harry's scar to sear with pain, but contact with Harry's skin burned Quirrell's hands, forcing him to release Harry. He woke in the hospital wing, where Albus Dumbledore reassured him that Quirrell did not succeed in getting the stone, and that the stone had, in fact, been destroyed. 
Dumbledore then explained the reason why Quirrell could not touch him, and it was because Harry's mother had died to save him, granting him protection against Voldemort. At the end of Term Feast, after seemingly congratulating Slytherin on winning the House Cup, Dumbledore awarded Ron and Hermione 50 points, Harry 60 points, and Neville 10, which allowed them to win the Cup. Second Year Harry's second year in 1992 started out badly and gradually got worse. Throughout the preceding summer, the Dursleys became so fearful of his newly discovered magical abilities that they locked away all of his school supplies immediately after his return home. They even went so far as to ban him from saying words pertaining to or related to magic in general, as evident to Harry getting reprimanded by Uncle Vernon for saying the word magic at the breakfast table one day. This, however, did not stop Harry from exploiting their paranoia in order to have a quiet time alone. Furthermore, he had no contact with any of his friends nor any news from the wizarding world, and Hedwig took to making noise out of boredom from being padlocked in her cage. On July 31st, Harry's 12th birthday, Harry felt lonely from receiving no letters from his friends. Dudley taunted him, stating, who would want to be friends with you? The Dursleys seemed to have forgotten his birthday too, for they were too busy preparing for a dinner party with a client of Vernon's at work. When he was sent up to his bedroom later that evening for the dinner party, he found a house elf named Dobby waiting on his bed to warn him against returning to Hogwarts, as it meant putting himself in great danger. He tried to tell Dobby that Hogwarts was his home and it was where he belonged. The elf then revealed that he prevented the direct deliverance of the mail from Harry's friends and promised to give the letters back when Harry complied with the warning. This bargain failed as well, so Dobby crashed the dinner party downstairs via a hover charm on Petunia's homemade masterpiece of pudding, which splattered everywhere when the spell was lifted and then disappeared. The mess left behind was thus blamed on Harry, who received an official warning from the Ministry of Magic about using magic outside of school. Taking advantage of this incident and using it as a means to suppress the magical blood in their nephew, the Dursleys locked him in his room with bars on his window to prevent him from returning to Hogwarts as punishment. Three nights later, Harry was rescued from his imprisonment by Ron, who was worried about not hearing from him all summer and flew with his older brothers Fred and George Weasley in a flying Ford Anglia belonging to their father, Arthur Weasley, to break the bars off Harry's window and help him retrieve his school things. Hedwig's screeches soon alerted the Dursleys of the getaway, but they were unable to do anything as the car flew off with Harry in tow. They arrived at their destination early the next morning to find a worried sick Molly Weasley waiting in the kitchen to punish her three sons for taking the vehicle without permission. Mr. Weasley came home to discuss the results of his proposed Muggle Protection Act to the Ministry with his family, and was glad to meet Harry once introduced to him, despite his wife berating him for bewitching their car. As a generous measure, the Weasleys welcomed the young wizard into the family fold for the rest of the summer, though this made Ron's younger sister, Ginny Weasley, spend the entire day hiding in Harry's presence. When a Hogwarts acceptance letter for Ginny arrived a week later, the Weasleys set out for Diagon Alley using the flu network eight days afterwards to buy some school supplies. Harry ended up at Borgen and Burke's in the adjacent Nocturne Alley. While inside the shop, he was forced to hide inside a crushing cabinet as Draco Malfoy and his father Lucius Malfoy entered. The shopkeeper, Mr. Borgen, was surprised that Mr. Malfoy was only selling dark and illegally enchanted artifacts and not buying. Mr. Malfoy was selling the items before they could be confiscated by the raids on wizarding households that Mr. Weasley was conducting as a part of the Muggle Protection Act. Borgen expressed pity for the current decline of blood purity. Draco, on the other hand, had interest in a few of the items already on sale, including the Hand of Glory and a cursed opal necklace, and was stopped from approaching Harry's hiding place by his father. As soon as the Malfoys left, Harry was found leaving the shop himself by Rubus Hagrid, who brought him out of Nocturne and into Diagon Alley's Flourish and Blots, where the Weasleys were in line with Hermione and her parents for a book signing for the arrival of the flamboyant but incompetent celebrity author Gilderoy Lockhart, who was recently appointed the new Defense Against the Dark Arts professor at Hogwarts. When Lockhart saw Harry for the first time, he got excited and beckoned him up to the front, allowing the audience to take pictures of them together before giving Harry a set of his books. Harry was too embarrassed by this publicity stunt and gave the books to Ginny since he could afford a set of his own. Draco went over to congratulate him for being unable to avoid making the front page while walking into a bookstore, and then his father moved him aside to have a one-on-one -on -one argument with Mr. Weasley over the latter's obsession with muggles, finding an example of which in Hermione's parents, both muggle dentists, provoking Weasley into lunging at him. Hagrid broke up the fight just in time, but not before the senior Malfoy slipped a diary into Ginny's cauldron of school books. 
Later, when Harry and Ron tried to get onto Platform 9 and 3 quarters to join Hermione and the rest of the Weasleys, the barrier mysteriously sealed and they hit the wall. They missed the Hogwarts Express as a result and decided to fly the car to Hogwarts reasoning that they would not be seen due to the invisibility booster that Mr. Weasley installed. However, this booster failed shortly after takeoff, and the car was spotted by several muggles as they flew northward alongside the train. Their day-long flight ended with them crashing into the Whomping Willow. Ron's wand was inadvertently broken by the resulting impact as the gigantic tree started pounding the car in anger from being hit. But 